All right. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to our second webinar of the Fall 2014 series. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium at the Open Ed Education Consortium. And um, today's topic is on open courses design and development. Um, and as uh, many of you recall, last month we uh, talked about uh, development and curation of open textbooks. Um, and so uh, today we're taking that a little further uh, with the development of OER-based courses. And um, we have the pleasure of having three experts in, in this area. Um, one from Northern Virginia Community College, a member of our um, community college consortium, um, also the University of Maryland University College, who is also an institutional member of the Open Education Consortium, and finally our colleagues from Lumen Learning who are doing some very exciting things in open course development as well. Before we get started, um, I just want to point out just a couple of features of the Blackboard Collaborate system, uh, which we are very pleased to use and that the California Community College system um, allows us to use. Um, on the left-hand side, you will see a participants window, um, and hopefully you'll see yourself in there and, um, uh, and let me see, uh, and 44 other attendees, and I'm sure we'll have a few more join us uh, before we get started here. Um, most of the questions, uh, certainly the verbal questions, we're going to keep till the end of the presentation simply because we have so much great information um, to uh, give you this morning. But please do use that chat window, which is immediately below the participants uh, window, to uh, provide comments and um, questions as, as we go along. And we'll come back to those at the end if we can't answer them uh, during, the, during, during the presentations. Now I'd like to ask you uh, to let us know where you're from. Um, you can pick up one of the little icons here uh, in the toolbar. Uh, the second icon down looks like a star. You can pick up items of interest and that, drag that over here to show us uh, where you're from. Uh, you're from North America, South America. Um, and if that doesn't work for you, um, just type in um, your uh, contact information or your institution in uh, the chat window and let us know. It looks like, oh my goodness, so we've got some folks from uh, all around uh, North America. It looks like we even have some folks from um, South America. So very exciting. Big audience today and a really interesting topic. I think everyone's going to really get a lot out of this. So thanks for sharing that. And um, this morning, um, our order of the agenda is after um, we're going to have some introductions and meet our, meet our speakers here in just a moment. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the Community College Consortium for OER, uh, which is uh, an associate consortium of the Open Education Consortium, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time. And then we're going to go straight to our presentations. Um, and uh, finally, we'll have time for questions at the end. So at this point, um, I'm going to ask our audience to introduce themselves in the chat window if they haven't done so already. And I can see many of you have done that, so thank you for that. And then um, I'm going to give each of our speakers a moment here to uh, say hello and um, tell us a little bit about their day job. And so we're going to start with Karen Vignare, the Vice Provost at University of Maryland University College. Um, Karen? Thanks, Una, and welcome, everybody. Um, we're really glad to be here, and we're glad you're also interested in this topic. Um, uh, at UMUC, I am the Vice Provost for the Center for Innovation and Learning and Student Success. Um, we um, are very interested as um, one of the largest uh, public online universities at really scaling up our innovations and improving processes. And we think OER is something that we can do um, that also, uh, while benefiting our students, also um, increases um, design. And um, we're looking forward to talking to you. Thank you, Karen. We're really pleased to have you today. And um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Preston Davis, who's the Director of Extended Learning at the Extended Learning Institute at Northern Virginia Community College. Preston? Yes, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to talk a little bit about 
uh, NOVA's program um, around open educational resources. And I'm uh, also very pleased to be sharing this presentation today with uh, UMUC and Lumen Learning as well. All right. Thanks very much, Preston. Um, very glad to have you today as well. And finally, um, we're very pleased to have um, Kim Banna join us. Uh, Kim is the CEO and co-founder of Lumen Learning, and um, they've really been a leader in um, OER-based um, course development. So, Kim. Hi, I'm Kim Thanos uh, from Lumen Learning. Uh, Lumen Learning is a company that David Wiley and I co-founded together. We are almost exactly two years old. Uh, really, the driver behind Lumen Learning is you know, focus on student success using OER, and you know our belief that we really need a more diverse ecosystem so that institutions can make investments in OER, and foundations and nonprofit organizations can as well. But there can also be some commercial solutions and commercial providers that work across institutions to enable sharing and success and progress. So that's the role we seek to fill at Lumen Learning. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Very happy to have you as well. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about the Community College Consortium. Um, we are an associate consortium of the Open Education Consortium. And our uh, mission is promoting adoption of open educational resources to enhance teaching and learning. Um, we're all about expanding access to education for students by um, not only making um, college more affordable, but providing high quality resources for um, independent learning as well. And this webinar series is part of our professional development outreach, um, where we um, try to provide information to community colleges. And, and in fact, I, I know a number of you are from four-year colleges about, about trends and where the open education space is going. And so this is a very important dialogue that we have um, monthly throughout the, um, throughout the academic year. And finally, um, we focus on um, what's of interest to community colleges, um, our students and faculty. But of course, our students often become students at the four-year colleges and universities. And so we also are very interested in what's happening in that space. And we um, just continue growing. Uh, 250 plus colleges now in 18 states and provinces. We're just adding Illinois. Uh, to um, our set of states, uh, the College of DuPage is joining us this month. So we're very pleased to have them as our newest member. So um, before we get started, I, I just wanted to give you a very brief overview of um, what the idea was behind uh, doing a webinar on OER-based course design and development. Of course, we know that uh, there can be many uh, positive outcomes for students. Uh, affordability is often the one that is, is mentioned um, in, in making courses OER-based and not requiring a, an expensive publisher textbook. Um, there's often other benefits, though, as a course is redesigned. Pedagogical improvements can be made with OER. Faculty have um, the freedom to choose from different materials. Um, to put together an OER-based course. And, and we've heard from faculty that this is, can be a very liberating experience. When they don't have a, an expensive publisher textbook assigned to their course, they often feel that they can uh, provide a more organic experience. They don't feel like they have to cover everything in the textbook simply because it costs over $200. So there's, there's a lot of benefits here that aren't always apparent um, initially as these are being developed, uh, with these, as these um, efforts are being launched. Um, I know our speakers today are going to go into a lot more detail about this. They're going to talk about the pedagogy around uh, their course design and development um, and some of the early outcomes that they're seeing for students. And finally, there's many institutional benefits and challenges around um, using OER-based course design and development. Um, obviously, affordability is, is, a, is a huge one. Um, uh, challenges over the long run, though, are, are things that need to be uh, considered in the planning um, so that this is a sustainable effort over time. And um, I'm going to let my speakers um, address those questions um, as they're quite capable of. 
And so our first speaker is going to be um, is going to be Dr. Davis from uh, Nova. And I just want to say a few words about uh, Preston because uh, we've been working with him for a long time now. He's been a member for three plus years, and um, they started their um, OER based. Um, General education um, certificate um, two years ago, I believe they actually they launched it fall a year ago. Um, of course, the planning and the development work was occurring before that, and this year they're offering even more courses um, leading to an associate's degree. So um, they've been um, they've had these small steps um, moving towards uh, this really successful outcome over the last few years, and um, I'd like to invite uh, Preston to tell us more about that. Great, thank you so much, Una. Um, <clears throat> so at Northern Virginia Community College, uh, we started about three years ago trying to figure out ways to um, increase student success and student access and reduce costs. And so we started planning a two-phase project around building a series of OER-based courses. And we started by focusing on first year of an associate's degree leading to a general study certificate, and then this year finish, finishing up with uh, full degree tracks that students could pursue um, taking uh, courses that use open educational resources and not requiring the purchase of textbooks. And so <clears throat> this is a program that we have launched through our online uh, campus, which is the Extended Learning Institute. Uh, we serve about 23,000 students online um, at NOVA. And we wanted to have a program that would allow every student the opportunity to take at least uh, one or two OER courses, if not a full degree. And so we took a broad approach to defining our project and what we wanted it to look like. And so in terms of open educational resources, we really wanted to share with faculty uh, what their options were and the variety of materials and resources that were available uh, to help encourage them to sort of take the leap and move away from relying on uh, the textbooks and publisher uh, insulated material that came along with that. And so we looked at um, you know, free uh, open textbooks, videos, uh, online tutorials, library collections, which include journals and other types of things, to build a comprehensive approach to incorporating uh, free and open content in our courses at NOVA. And so the reason <coughs> that we've pursued this project uh, was uh, first to increase access. Um, one of the things that we noticed, um, that I noticed personally when, when teaching and, and many of my colleagues noticed as well, is that quite often there are a number of students in a course that do not have the textbook. Um, most often it's because they can't afford to purchase all of their textbooks. And I recently was presenting to a group of faculty and I asked for a show of hands uh, how many faculty uh, knew of um, students in their courses that did not purchase the textbook. And about three quarters of the room raised their hand. And then I asked the question, do you know how much students pay for the textbook that you use? And only about one quarter of the room raised their hand. Um, so there is a little bit of a disconnect. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we um, addressed that and provided uh, the students taking these courses with access to all of the required materials that were needed from day one in the course. Um, of course, increasing affordability was a major concern as well. Um, textbooks can be very expensive, and we know that oftentimes students do have to make choices in what they can afford and what they cannot afford to purchase. And we wanted to reduce or eliminate that uh, dilemma, if at all possible. And finally, student success, which is really why we're all here in the first place. Uh, we wanted to make sure that by providing the required material to students um, from day one, um, that everyone was on an even playing field, 
everyone had um, the material necessary to succeed, and we've seen that it has paid dividends for our students at NOVA. <clears throat> so we approached this project um, by developing faculty workshops and training on open educational resources to help faculty really understand what it meant and how to get from point A to point B. Um, we have resource sites that are geared towards faculty and students, which provide information, links to materials and, and resources that they can use. Um, a robust collection development program through our library system where we really work to bring in materials that are going to be available for students at no cost to them um, that are directly related to the courses and the programs that we offer uh, so that we can in, embed those materials in our courses uh, for students. Um, maximizing that digital content delivered online is important because we know that students who are taking online courses through NOVA um, have technology skills and uh, are used to getting material uh, through various uh, multimedia sources. And so there's not that steep learning curve or jump that they have to make in getting material deli diver delivered digitally uh, versus through a, a standard paper textbook. Um, and all of this was really uh, established to set up our academic program uh, starting with the uh, certificate and then moving into the full associate degree uh, tracks that we do have available currently to students at NOVA. <clears throat> and so we currently have de developed 25 OER based courses uh, that are available to students. Um, students are saving in excess of $200,000 a semester in the textbook costs. Um, looking at the courses and the enrollments in those courses versus what they were in the previous versions where textbooks were required. Um, and we chose um, a broad um, selection of general education courses uh, so that they would impact uh, potentially every student at the college in some way. So we wanted to make sure that you know, students who had very specific academic programs and needed specific courses that required textbooks and other materials would still be able to benefit by taking some of their general education courses um, using open educational resources. Um, and we really do work with our faculty to help them to identify, um, develop, curate, remix, uh, whatever their needs are around open educational resources, we work to help them with that. Um, and again, saving money by doing away with textbooks also has the added benefit of allowing faculty to not have to work on a publisher's schedule in terms of updating course content around new textbook editions and other types of, of things. Um, once the course is developed and they have the materials, um, then they really have that ownership, which is kind of a strange word to use when we're talking about open and sharing material, but you know, they really have that control um, of their uh, courses, and I think that that is important to them. <clears throat> and so I'm not going to go through this whole list, but these are the courses that we currently have available. Um, that use open educational resources. So you can see that there's quite a variety, uh, English, math, science, history, humanities, um, you know, fine arts, um, social sciences. We wanted to make sure that we had a very broad footprint um, for our faculty and our students to take advantage of. And so the way we launched this program was to um, provide a small stipend uh, for faculty uh, that uh, came from a grant that we received from our community college system in Virginia um, to help them develop the new course material and content or um, pull together the resources that they needed. Um, but certainly the faculty really couldn't do that on their own. and so. You know, we really put together a team that comprised our um, online librarians, our instructional design team, 
Um, and we wanted to make sure that you know we were working in lockstep towards an end goal of having a course that was going to be um, a quality course following our same quality matter standards, but not requiring students to, to purchase textbooks. Uh, we also have a shared services distance learning program where we offer online courses that can uh, be taken at 21 of the community colleges in Virginia. And of course, we wanted to make sure that these courses were also available as opportunities for other institutions in Virginia uh, to take advantage of and have some of their students participate in these courses as well. And so we chose faculty who we knew uh, were innovative and liked to incorporate technology and digital content in their courses. Um, they understood course design um, and had worked with our faculty, our, our instructional designers in the past, and um, had used uh, library collections, uh, other open content, or had expressed an interest in, in doing so. Um, and we're really supportive of our end goal um, because it, it, in order to have this project work on the timeline that we had established, uh, we really needed to make sure that the faculty were fully supportive and were going to really roll up their sleeves and uh, work to get the, the courses completed. And they, they really did so and have done a phenomenal job. And so these are just some of the resources that our faculty uh, have used. Um, there are many, many other excellent resources out there that aren't on this page, but I just wanted to highlight a few of the sites that we know our faculty used and, and made um, uh, or found resources that they incorporated into their courses uh, from these particular sites. Um, there are many, many out there, but these were some that were useful for the faculty in our current program. And this is a listing of the cost of the textbooks in the courses that we redesign using open educational resources. So you can see the average cost of textbooks was $185. And if a student uh, pursues the OER degree track, um, and takes all of the OER courses in the associate's degree program that we have, they'll save $3,600 over the courses, the course costs for textbooks in those courses. And finally, the outcomes uh, that we have seen. Um, we know that these courses are more affordable because we've seen the cost savings um, per semester that students have enjoyed. Um, our, set, our success rates have improved in almost all of the OER courses. Uh, it's very important that we look at the success rates uh, in these courses. And we have found that um, having access to all the materials uh, has really helped those students who may not have been able to purchase everything to have what they need to be successful. Um, we are working with um, a Kaleidoscope, with Lumen, uh, for developing some of our campus-based courses to use open educational resources, and those should be launching in the spring. Um, and we want to make them available to other schools, both in the BCCS and sharing our program um, nationally. We've had a few other schools in our system adopt our model and are working on a general education certificate for open education with open educational resources at several other colleges in Virginia. Um, and uh, we've been recognized for our efforts um, with a WCET WOW Award, which is a nice uh, recognition to say that we you know, have established something that is really benefiting our students in some way. So thank you. And let me turn it over to my colleague from Maryland. All right. Thank you very much, Preston. And you um, had a few uh, questions in the chat window, which I'll, I'll let you address there um, over chat. Uh, and we'll come back to some of those at the end. Uh, thanks very much for sharing that. Um, next, I, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Karen Vignari from the University of Maryland University College. And I, I just wanted to say about Karen, um, 
many of you probably know that she was at Michigan State University for many years uh, in developing some amazing OER uh, programs, uh, some in the health area and otherwise. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Karen, but Karen's only been at uh, University of Maryland University College for um, just uh, not even a year and a half now. And um, she brought, I think, open education with her and has made some amazing strides. And I think she's going to tell us uh, this morning about how in uh, just slightly over a year, they have brought OER into uh, OER embedded resources into 50% of their undergraduate courses. So a huge uh, step forward in a very short period of time. And Karen, I'd like to turn it over to you for the details. Uh, thanks, Una. And um, yes, um, Una is correct. I was at Michigan State, which was absolutely, yes, go green, yes, Spartans. Um, a, a great place to work, a lot of innovation. Um, the opportunity to come to UMUC um, is really about um, why I think all of you are involved in the community college. Um, this is a pioneering place in adult and distance um, education. Um, we are really driven to make sure our students uh, can find uh, uh, jobs. Um, and um, the opportunities here with the leadership that we have have just been um, amazing. Um, and I happened to walk in at the time the president had already made a commitment. So our goal um, as of last summer uh, was no cost materials for students. And within that goal, um, we want to maximize the use of high quality open education resources. Um, obviously, that also means we are using other types of things. That is, we could be using um, open access materials. We could be using e-books. That's not where we want to end up, but the, our first and foremost goal is to achieve very rapidly no-cost materials for students. Um, and then we hope to go back um, and really do some of the incredible work that I hear Preston talking about um, as a colleague in the metro area of Washington, D.C. in terms of redesign. And I think that's what Kim will also share, some of the incredible work that they are doing around redesign. Um, so again, this looks very familiar to what um, uh, what Preston had already shared. Um, so I think I'll move ahead. Um, we have created um, a team approach, a very, very important. Our in, uh, learning a solutions design team is working with our library, um, and they work with our program directors and faculty. Um, as many of you know, and for those who don't know, um, UMUC um, uses primarily adjuncts. Uh, we have about Depending on the program, 15 to 20 percent of our staff, um, and that includes faculty, are full time, um, and the rest are adjuncts. But within that full time staff, we've created a very collaborative process to identify materials, um, to make sure that we actually um, clear them, that they can go into our classroom, that they are stored in our content management system, and that curation process has been done very rapidly for us. So our timeline uh, was uh, this fall, 50% of all undergraduate courses to have free embedded um, electronic resources. We actually achieved that. Um, and then a little bit some. Um, and our status is we currently have 538 um, courses out of um, 745. That means 72% of our stateside undergraduate, TUS stands for the undergraduate school, um, University of Maryland, University of College college only really has two um, colleges, and that is um, the undergraduate school and the graduate school, um, have completed the e-resources. And um, Una is correct. This has been a major project for us to undertake, but I don't want to underwrite um, the kind of work that all of you might undertake, and that is I see some really promising things around redesign with OER. Um, what we did was, um, I think, also important, but we haven't gotten to some of those hard things around redesign. So by spring of 2015, we should have another 11 cent percent complete, which means our target for next year um, is to have 100% of our undergraduate um, courses with those no-cost materials. Um, and um, again, 
constantly revisiting um, where we can find open educational resources, um, as well as um, by fall 2016 to have 100% of our graduate uh, resource. Now, I do want to make it clear um, this effort has some funding behind it. Um, I didn't add that into the slide because that's actually um, in development. So as we're reaching um, the harder and harder courses to locate appropriate ones, and we're finding that certain things like ebooks are not as um, friendly as we had hoped. Um, they create additional problems. We're now going back and looking at what courses we really either need to build resources for or we need to go deeper um, to find the appropriate resources. Um, so um, at this point, um, I don't have a final dollar amount on what we've spent. Um, and um, our estimated savings at this point in time is about $5 million. We're doing very conservative kind of calculations. That's based on previous textbook cost. And I believe um, Preston already shared, um, but we also believe that only about 40, maybe 50% of our students were actually buying textbooks. Um, so we're trying to keep those in alignment. Um, if we were to just have that simple calculation of what we've re replaced, um, that savings amount would go up. Um, and obviously, these savings will be repeated uh, year in and year out. Um, we are trying to work on a public-facing website to kind of share this detail. Um, but uh, Una and I were both at um, the Open Educational Consortium's um, uh, international meeting. Um, and we do have a case study that's available um, through the OEC um, open praxis um, information. Um, it is dated, so we've gotten further along, but at least then you'll see some of our processes. So right now, our concerns around the curation of resources, and I would assume this is a concern for all of you, this has been a very time-consuming process. Um, and we were doing it at the same time we were replacing our LMS. Um, as we've now replaced our LMS, um, we're actually looking at what is it we can do better. So we're looking at while we have done this heavy lift of, of getting to know class, now we have to go back and revisit what I said. I'm so admiring about Preston's work is that they've really gone in with a design approach um, immediately where we went in as a replacement um, of resources approach. Um, and then we are also trying, again, the reason I came to UMUC, such a great place to be right now, is we're trying to transform our learning model. We're trying to figure out personalized tools, adaptive tools. Um, and it, if we have these kinds of resources for our students, will we even have enough OER right now? Um, and um, as a community, will we be able to create enough um, uh, in order to actually have these tools run effectively. Um, and we really do think we have to continually improve this, even though we're meeting um, our current um, timelines and schedules. Um, so I saw some questions, but I want to make sure Kim has plenty of time. Um, so I'll go back through the chat window. Um, and then um, that will allow us, um, allow me to address you in chat. Kim? All right. Thanks very much, Karen. And uh, there were some good questions in there. And um, once again, we will, if Karen doesn't have a chance to answer them in the chat, we'll come back to those. Um, now I want to introduce Kim Thanos, who is the CEO and co-founder of Lumen Learning. But just a little background. I think um, I met Kim probably about three years ago, um, maybe a little bit longer. Um, when the first Next Generation Learning Challenge Grants came out, and um, she was heading up the Kaleidoscope project. And of course, we know um, that grew into um, a much bigger effort, which is now Live and Learning. And um, they have gone through um, multiple phases um, in terms of um, OER-based design and development. And um, the pedagogy that they bring to this process is really compelling. And I think um, we can all learn a great deal from how they develop their courses, not only to be OER based, but to be um, outcomes driven and um, just to overall be um, to lead to better student learning. So Kim, uh, please tell us more about that. 
thanks so much, Una. And I have a problem always with volume, so if I'm getting too soft, please don't hesitate to let me know that in the chat. Um, just a quick overview. I thought I might go through just an overview of, of what we do, who Lumen Learning is, and what we do. And then, you know, of course, we would love to work with all of you. But I was also trying to pull out kind of what is the element of what we do that even if you aren't working with us, there might be some experience that you can gain from the process that we've been through. Uh, you know, we've had the the privilege of working with both Karen and, and Preston in some way, and look forward to doing that again in the future, and many of you as well. And I feel like one of the advantages we have working across institutions is that there are some learning cycles that we end up going through. And so I feel like for everything that I can present that we're doing really well, it's from, from many, many mistakes made along the way and anything I can share that helps you down that path in a more graceful way than we've made our way down that path. I always feel like that's important to do. So very similar to, to Preston and to Karen, I feel like it's important important to start from a point that you know, we really focus on improving student success. And I think that open educational resources and the use of data and analytics are really key to being able to do that. I don't believe for most of our students we can separate the ideas of cost and quality and have that actually hang together as an argument. So we really feel like that improves student success is key. And OER is the processor kind of tool set or approach we bring to that. Um, our process overall, just to kind of lay our model on the table so there aren't questions about it, we start by really creating and sharing high quality open courseware that's made from OER. And we view that as courseware is, you know, it needs to be a complete textbook replacement that is bringing together different components to make that possible. Everything that we create ourselves, we license using a Creative Commons attribution license and we share that out openly. Uh, we're also using the work of many others from around the community and when that carries a different license, then we of course are respecting that license and, and appreciate the opportunity to partner with and build upon the work of many. Uh, when we uh, work directly with institutions, we bring that course that, where that we've developed and we provide hosting and services and support for that to do institutional customizations. And that is all done at a per enrollment fee. I'll talk a little bit more about what that is in the next slide. And as, as, as both of the previous presenters mentioned, that per enrollment fee is paid by the institution. Most often institutions are putting a small material fee on the course, so they're passing that along to students, but it's allowing every student to have access from day one so that all of the students can keep and share and use their learning resources as they, as they move through their education. When I talk about courseware, this is a slide I've, I've borrowed from Michael Feldstein and Phil Hill. Uh, you know, we're looking at this kind of yellow circle concept of courseware, which is you know, the content, the open educational resources are really key to what we're delivering, and yet it's also the right technology solution around that that allows that to work well with any LMS, that allows that to have the kind of interactivity and, and, and effective design that's needed, and then of course that design element, instructional design and overall course design to support learning and take advantage of what we're learning about learning through uh, the learning sciences. So we bring all of that together into two models. And you know, our historical model that we've really evolved and focused around is this supported open courseware. And so the cost for that is we are supporting institutions to use that is $5 per enrollment. And that really allows us to have a complete package that we can provide to faculty members that replaces and is comparable in quality to traditional textbook replacement. Uh, newly, we've been working with the state of Washington in their competency-based program that's launching in January to develop 18 fully OER-based courses that are competency-based, that have adaptive delivery. That's a higher cost, $40 per enrollment. And as with the supported open courseware, uh, Washington is, is including that as the material free for the course and providing full access to all students that are moving through that program. So those are the two different models that we use. I'm going to spend a little more time on the design process around the supported open courses because I think that's probably what's most um, replicable by, by other programs and projects. I will say that the reason for the higher cost in the mastery courses is the design process around that is a heavy design process and the platform requirements to deliver that uh, are, are significant and the costs around that are significant to have the adaptive engine and the personalized delivery and all of those components as well. 
So in our supported open courses, we use a standard backward design process. This is a look into one of the course templates that we worked through with a group of faculty members. So you'll see column A is where we start, which is the outcomes for the course. So um, one of the, the things, you know, Una mentioned that there's, that there's a tendency for faculty members to cover more content than they um, really need to or than, than is included in their outcomes because they're trying to help students get their money's worth from an expensive textbook. And so we're really trying to back away from the traditional table of contents and have faculty members start from the outcomes of the course. Then we talk through with them how are you assessing whether those outcomes have been met. And only then do we say what is the best content resource to provide that outcome to achieve that outcome. And the faculty members go through a review. You can see kind of across the bottom we give suggestions of where they might start in evaluating content and considering content. I will say it is unusual that we come through this and it is simply a single source. You know, what we are doing most often is remixing uh, based on the faculty's feedback, the best collective set of resources and bringing that together in a cohesive way. And so with that, we move to our next step, which is building master courses. Uh, the platform that we're using for building master courses, we call it the Candela platform. It looks very familiar to my Canadian friends. Uh, BC campuses, we've collaborated quite a bit with their team around the, the platform itself and are using a common technology for this that's really built on WordPress and love working with them. So we build this course. It gives the faculty member who's reviewing this a way to look at it that's very consistent and easy and, again, comparable to a publisher's e-text. Uh, we bring text and images into these. Uh, we're also able to look at uh, contributions from across our community. So here's an example of a sample discussion forum that we've brought in that if you look towards the bottom, you see it's created by Linda Williams of Tidewater Community College in their um, Z degree program. And basically, the way this is designed, citations is now in our instance been changed to attributions. But you see that little attributions word at the bottom. You click on that, and there's it, it expands to be able to show you what the attribution is in the course. We have what we call an embedded assessments tool. So it lets us drop formative assessments in throughout any of the text, add video, have formative assessments around video so that students can test their understanding as they're moving through the courses. So those are really the steps that we go through in creating master course, and then it goes through the quality review. And you know, as Karen mentioned in, in the chat, one of the elements is doing an ADA review of the courses. But you know, there are a bunch of different things that we go through in each of these master courses and do a complete quality check of those. It's a pretty extensive review, but that gives you a look into some of the things on that list. And then once we've been through that process, we publish those. And most often as we're publishing, um, we, we do share these out. We're, we're, we've been going through a big kind of technology transition of getting these all built out in the Candela platform. And so we've been a little slow to get them on our public facing website and have been more focused on the institutions that are using them initially so that we can make sure we go through that pilot and beta process effectively. Uh, we, you know, we create this for each institution so that they have a look into what are the open courses available for the institution. And as we get started working with an institution, then that moves us from this master course view into that next step of letting faculty members really go in, roll up their sleeves, and make this their own. So that means they move things around. What I see them do most often is delete. It's either deleting entire sections that aren't covered in their outcomes, or it is thinning the content so that they can really focus the learners on the materials that are most important. So this shows how you would move things around and adjust what's in the sections. And then the faculty members can also click in and do that kind of word level editing. If you're familiar with WordPress, this is going to look very familiar to you because that's, that's actually the underlying technology of that. So in our design goals for these supported open courses, what we're really trying to do is to create something that is almost as easy as really one-click adoption for faculty members that are really willing to make this change and do something to better support student learning, and, and, and yet they just are not going to build from scratch. Um, we do see, my point number two, this kind of difference in archetypes amongst faculty members with which we work. There are builders, there are adapters, there are adopters. And you know, we've also really tried with this to create something that a builder can look at what's here and say, excellent, I understand what's been done, I get what's happening, I'm starting from scratch, I'm building my own course or writing my own, my own set of materials that you know, can, can support that range of use cases. Um, the fully enabling all five R's, 
honestly our driver to pull this out of an LMS. We we have been building courses. We have built open courses in seven different LMSs and have some strong preferences through that process. But you know what we found is that we were trying to use the LMS as a content management system and they were not designed for that. They do not do it well. They do not allow us to continue to do the kind of remixing and revision and, and redistribution that needs to happen. And we also feel like it's really important that we have a platform that an approach that allows a remix of materials and then students or faculty members to be able to, to do a PDF export or an EPUB export that gives a consistent look and feel to the materials that have been remixed and allows students to retain that and carry that forward and not lose that at the end of the course when the LMS course closes down and they, and they need to go back and reference those materials. And then finally being able to really do the kind of data driven enhancement to the courses. So uh, that's the quick overview of the design process that we use for the supported open courses. I'll do a really quick run through some of what we're doing with these adaptive courses and that we're calling mastery based courses. And then also kind of note what's next with those as we move ahead. Our design goals with the mastery courses are very different. We are really using OER to say, can we really take advantage of the full power of personalized learning in a more cost effective way than what we're seeing happening? When we look at the collective cost of just to, to call out a, a Pearson textbook with the Pearson's My Math Lab adding the Newton capability on top of that, we are getting to a price point that is exceptionally high for what's likely a developmental math course that a student might have to take a couple of times. So, you know, really trying to keep that cost low. And the one size fits one approach. How can we really use the freedom of OER to have more derivative works and use learning data to meet the needs of every learner? We're trying to keep as much revision capability as we can, but still taking advantage of learning science-driven design. So that's a balance. And then the last one is we're trying to make sure that even though uh, when we're building an, adapt in an adaptive platform, that it's really going to require kind of a, a, a pay-to-use kind of process for institutions, but that we're still making sure that all of the assets that we're creating can be pushed back out into the commons with a CC BY license so that other people can use them and build on them and improve them and we can continue to have that sense of community. So this is the design process. It's in the slides. I want to make sure there's time for, for presentation for questions with everyone. So I'm just going to kind of gloss over this and say, you know, we're really looking to how can we take some of the historical challenges in the research data around competency-based learning, bring those forward, address them in an instructional design approach that brings in more relevance, more context, and more ability for students to synthesize uh, complex concepts. So this is, this is what it, it begins to look like. Uh, the mastery design, I mentioned one of the design criteria is it's competency based. And so this is a look into the microeconomics course with, with a set of competencies that kind of scroll down lower, but that gives you a view of how that looks and the students see their progress through each of the competencies in those graphics. Uh, the, the relevance, and this is really a mock-up, so you'll see the lorem ipsum content in there, that is, you know, how can we take each of these competencies and give students a view into how someone in the real world uses this concept and is able to, to take care of that. Um, then the diagnostics. So if you look in this top right hand corner, we have a show what you know area where the first thing the students are able to do is go in if they have prior work experience, if they have military experience, they have an opportunity to actually kind of show what they know in the course and accelerate through some of the, some of the components. And then finally this ability to drill down in terms of the context to be able to see what are the subcomponents that make up each of these and then bring them back together and show that the students can uh, do some assessments through this process or get some feedback through the process in their ability to combine complex concepts. So, you know, we're trying to move to a situation where instead of students gaining mastery in eggs, butter, flour, vanilla, that they actually have the ability to bake a cake and demonstrate mastery in cake baking. So that you know, this kind of pulling it all together is that, uh, is that focus on being able to bring those together. So I want to make sure that I, I leave time for questions. I'm just looking at the, at the chat and let me answer one thing quickly. Um, you know, historically as we've been trying to create some uh, tool sets that can be used across LMSs, we have built in Canvas. 
and our idea with Canvas that we thought was just genius and a great breakthrough is that we would build in Canvas and then we would have common cartridge exports that anyone could use and implement in any LMS. And I would say that that has worked badly. <laughs> so it's one of our lessons learned is that you know part of our focus and investment in really uh, moving towards a platform that externalizes the content is it does allow us to uh, to have all of that working in a system where it's presented in a way that students can can follow that through in a cohesive way that works well, and then we use LTI to plug that into any LMS so that it works with any LMS and isn't really constrained by what our initial build system was. So that seems to be working much better than what we had done in the past, which was which was was quite painful. All right. So with that, I, I actually left Nate's contact information here just because Nate is is, is a, a great source for follow up and quite often more responsive than I am. So I wanted to make sure you have his information for for follow up. All right. Well, thank you, Kim. Um, that um, great information and uh, lots of questions. Uh, before we go into our official Q and A, and thank thank you to all of our speakers for um, keeping your comments uh, within our time limit. So we do have some time for Q and A. I just wanted to mention that our next webinar, our November webinar, will be Wednesday, November 12th, and it will be on open pedagogies, and it will be featuring faculty and students from colleges. And um, we have two confirmed uh, groups. We might have another one: uh, one from College of the Canyon in California, and one from Tacoma in Washington State. And uh, now I'd like to go to questions, and I, I just want to recapture a couple of the questions which have floated around, and then we'll be open to the, to the new ones <laughs> here. And once again, we do have emails here in case we miss yours um, inadvertently. Um, I know that there were some early uh, questions uh, in the chat window about um, incentivizing faculty. And I think these were originally addressed to, to um, to Preston and um, Karen, and did you did you want to just uh, recap that quickly, Preston? What what kind of incentives you offer faculty to participate? Sure, um, we offered a small stipend um, in the beginning to help to compensate faculty for their time and and to incentivize the move from uh, you know using a textbook um, as, as the you know, foundation of the course for students to moving away from that to free digital and open educational resources. Um, that was, a, I mean, the, the stipend was relatively small. What we did was we made sure that we had the services to support faculty in addition to that with our instructional design team, with our librarians, um, and with other folks so that it was a partnership and the faculty were not sort of floundering to try to put something together themselves, uh, but really had um, the support to make it happen in you know a relatively short time frame. Thank you for that, Preston. Yeah, that addressed a, a couple of other questions that came up around how do you help faculty to find those materials. And so you use both librarians, which of course are search experts and curators, and, and, and also instructional designers, which um, help with um, Making the course, which uh, I think was really critical. Um, there was there was a question um, that came about uh, resistance from faculty, and Karen, I think um, that one was directed at you. Were there faculty who were reluctant to engage in these OER-based courses, either developing them or teaching? Them? Uh, yeah, and I did try to answer that in um, the chat, but let me just um, summarize. Um, Again, we are a different kind of institution. We offer um, basically model <laughs> courses. Um, and yes, some of our um, uh, courses are taught by very small groups and for small groups. But generally, many of our courses see anywhere from you know, uh, 3,000 to 5,000 enrollments a year. And as such, um, getting people to participate um, is a little bit of a different process. So yeah, we've had faculty reluctance. And some of it's for good reason. Um, uh, some books come with software that students can then manipulate. Um, so some of those issues we're still trying to grapple around. Uh, faculty do not disagree with the idea of lowering costs for students. So that's really the focus that we maintain um, while we try to work through the process. 
ultimately at UMUC, that trumps everything. So um, faculty do not have the right not to use the model course. So they have to use what it is that is given to them. They can add new materials, but they can't ask for a student to buy a book. So again, because of our model, we're a little bit different. Um, so um, I'm not sure what I can advise the rest of you about getting faculty participation. Okay. Well, thanks for that, Karen. Yeah, and it, it is an interesting model. And, and I think, uh, Kim, I don't want to speak for you, but um, I think that you let colleges, um, you know, uh, choose the faculty that are going to participate uh, with uh, Lumen Learning. Um, so you're less involved in that piece, um, I assume. Yes, we are. You know, I, I do. My, my experience is across institutions is very similar to both what both Karen and and um, Preston have said, though, in terms of, of the idea that um, we see generally one of two models. One which is kind of seeking interest from faculty members and using those as the initial faculty members, and then seeing real success with those first faculty members advocating with their peers. You know, the number one complaint and concern from faculty members is this is going to take too much time. And a faculty member who's already been through the process, who can share with a peer what they have done and help them see that there's not a lot of time required to take advantage of the work that's already been done, really helps with that process. And then in other cases, the institution's really driving it from a departmental level. And, and that is, especially in institutions that have a very high number of adjuncts or heavy turnover amongst the adjunct population. Um, that's that's something we see more commonly. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, there was uh, questions also about um, digital formats and printing, and um, I think uh, Karen, some of that may have been addressed uh, to you initially. Uh, did you want to speak a little bit about uh, the printing capability, digital formats, and obviously? ADA comes into play, and I, I think probably all three of you have something to say on this one. Uh, yeah, I, I do want to say that, um, again, remember our promise, um, our goal was no cost materials. And while we want to be, quote unquote, a good citizen in OER, that meant we chose some e-books, e-texts, um, um, because we had access to them. Um, we're hoping to um, redo them, but we have found that our e-texts really, um, in a high way, just simply repeat what we used to do with the old textbook, right? They're not integrated. So that's a bigger issue. but. Also, the issue around certain e-text is really going through, um, and for our Canadian friends, um, the American for Disabilities and the 508 compliance rules. Um, I saw that UBC has um, already a great set of practices. But this issue is harder where faculty are creating their own courses without um, help from other people. So in our process, we do this as a team. And so anything that um, has been brought in um, by UMUC has actually gone through a cleared process. The problem is when the adjunct faculty, who means well, brings in an additional open resource um, that actually hasn't been gone through an ADA. I think, uh, unfortunately, for many of you on this call, this is going to be a much larger issue, how you're going to work through clearance when you're very faculty um, centric, and that is you're allowing them to create that course. OK. Well, thank you, Karen. And um, so uh, Preston, you um, have an instructional designer work with your faculty um, on developing the course. Does that help with addressing the issue of accessibility and uh, support for students with disabilities? Uh, yes, we, we, we definitely try to address that. And we're really making a systematic uh, effort to make sure that that is something that we are doing when we are revising courses, but we're also going back and making sure that courses that were revised or, or, or developed um, previously uh, are, are addressing those issues. Um, and uh, Maureen is here uh, on the uh, participation, participating in the webinar today, is an instructional designer at NOVA who um, is basically leading a project to make sure that we're going back and looking at our courses 
um, and making sure that we have captions and we have transcripts and other types of things available uh, where necessary and while at the same time our, our instructional development process incorporates that in future development for courses. Okay, well, thank you. That that is great to hear, um, Kim. I want to change the the topic just a little bit since we're running out of time here. And and there was a lot of um, questions, and you may have answered those. You and Nate may have answered those in the um, chat window now. But just um, you're developing your courses now using the Candela system, which I think is somewhat LMS agnostic. Um, it can be um, apparently. Um, it, Things can be moved, um, exported, um, um, in and out. Um, does, do you have a requirement for your courses that the materials are printable, or do, or does that vary from course to course? Or um, what do you what what sort of standards do you have around um, access and accessibility? Well, it's one of the it was one of the drivers around the kind of externalizing this from the LMS. So there is a capability in the platform that um, that I can I want to say it's one click, but it's not. It's about three clicks to be able to create a complete PDF export of all of the materials in the in in the course. And so you know it's really useful because you know there was a question on the listserv around printing. Boundless materials or printing, you know, if you're trying to remix a number of different OER based materials or openly licensed materials, it's really difficult to have them come together, you know, digitally to start with in a way that feels cohesive, but even more so if you're trying to create a print version. And so it gives us a way that, you know, you can go in and say, I want an export of this course that is a PDF or an EPUB or a Mobley version that gives gives the student then the ability to have have a print option. Now often the institution is saying we're going to work with our bookstore and our print center to have a print option available for students using the same kind of transactional process. And I love that because ideally this is all creating more options. And what we want to see happen is every student has access to their course materials from day one. But if that digital access that I have on day one isn't meeting my needs, then I run to the bookstore and I get a print version or wherever that's being delivered. And so, you know, that's that's part of what what I think we're all working towards across the many different projects is to make sure that every option is available that's going to best support student learning. All right. Well, thank you, Kim. That that was very helpful. That you have that um, PDF option built in, and of course. Um, individual institutions uh, may provide that um, at their own discretion through their bookstore, which is another interesting approach. Well, I want to thank um, all of our audience and the great questions we got this morning, and of course our three wonderful presenters. Uh, once again, I'm sorry if we couldn't answer all of your questions um, during uh, during this presentation, but um, we do have those emails there. Please do follow up with us and. Um, once again, the archive for this will be posted um, early next week um, on the OER consortium site. So thanks once again, and um, hope to see you next month uh, on November 12th. And a round of applause for our presenters. Amazing job. Thank you.